Doctrine and Covenants 60, 61, and 62 are three revelations related to the return journey of Joseph Smith and other church elders to their homes in Ohio after having spent several weeks in Missouri in the summer of 1831. Section 60 initiates their return home. Section 61 addresses some trouble upon the waters they encountered as they traveled down the Missouri River. And Section 62 is a revelation received as a result of a serendipitous meeting of elders traveling to and from Zion. Let's start with the backstory of Section 60. It had been nearly a month since Joseph and other elders had arrived in western Missouri in Jackson County as the Lord had commanded them. Since that time, they had learned of the site of the future city of Zion, the New Jerusalem. They had dedicated the land of Zion generally, as well as the spot for the temple specifically, in the center place of Zion. And they had held the first conference of the church in Zion. About this conference, Joseph's history says simply, On the 4th of August, I attended the first conference in the land of Zion. It was held at the house of Brother Joshua Lewis, a convert from the area, in presence of the Colesville branch of the church. The Spirit of the Lord was there. A few days after this conference, on August 8th, Joseph said there was some inquiry among the elders what they were to do now that their major objectives for this trip to Missouri had been achieved. In D&C 58, received one week earlier, the Lord had already instructed that after this conference was held, Joseph, Sidney Rigdon, and Oliver Cowdery were to return to Ohio. And those elders who had not been appointed to stay in Missouri were also to return home after having preached in the area. So it's likely that the elders' question on August 8th was to know whether or not it was now time to implement this D&C 58 instruction. Joseph asked the Lord about the matter, and section 60 was the result. So that's the backstory. Now let's take a look at the Lord's response. He begins by confirming that the elders are now to return speedily to the land from whence they came. And while he is generally pleased with their efforts and obedience thus far, with some I am not well pleased, he says, for they will not open their mouths, but they hide the talent which I have given unto them because of the fear of man. The Lord seems here to be referring to elders like Ezra Booth and Isaac Morley, who had not spent sufficient time preaching God's word along their journey from Ohio to Missouri, as D&C 52 had instructed, instead traveling quickly to Missouri, and thus not opening their mouths to preach, but hiding the gospel gift they had received. Woe unto such, he says, for mine anger is kindled against them, and if they are not more faithful unto me, it shall be taken away even that which they have. But as concerning their return journey home, the Lord instructs, Let there be a craft made, or bought, as seemeth you good, it mattereth not unto me, and take your journey speedily for the place which is called St. Louis. Then Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith, and Oliver Cowdery are to journey to Cincinnati, and there lift up their voice and declare my word in that region. As for the rest of the elders, from St. Louis they are to fan out two by two and preach the word, not in haste, among the congregations of the wicked until they return home. Bishop Edward Partridge is to impart a portion of the money which I have given him to help fund the homeward-bound journey of mine elders who are commanded to return. Those who can later repay him should do so. And those who cannot, of him it is not required. In verses 12 to 16, the Lord then addresses those elders who were still en route to Zion, but who had not yet come unto this land. To them his commandment is, Thou shalt not idle away thy time, neither shalt thou bury thy talent that it may not be known. In this context, burying their talent seems to mean not sharing the gift of the gospel with which they have been entrusted, and idling away their time in lesser pursuits would amount to lost opportunities to share the gospel. The Lord did not call them to come here for sightseeing. Thus, even after their arrival, they are to stay single-focused on their mission. And after thou hast come up unto the land of Zion, and hast proclaimed my word, he says, thou shalt speedily return home, proclaiming my word among the congregations of the wicked, not in haste, neither in wrath nor with strife. And against those who receive thee not, he tells them to shake off the dust of thy feet, but not in their presence, lest thou provoke them, as happened with Parley Pratt among the shakers. They were to do this and then wash their feet, the Lord explains, as a symbolic testimony against those people in the day of judgment. This Elder James E. Talmadge once referred to as an ordinance of accusation. He then concludes the revelation saying that this is sufficient for you and the will of him who hath sent you. Further instruction will be given later concerning Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery and the residue hereafter by the mouth of my servant Joseph Smith, Jr. Even so, amen. The day after this revelation was received, Joseph's history states that, in company with ten elders, I left Independence Landing for Kirtland. We started down the Missouri River in canoes and went the first way as far as Fort Osagi, about 15 miles downriver, where we had an excellent wild turkey for supper. According to Ezra Booth, one of the elders on this trip, 
The next day, a spirit of animosity and discord made its appearance as they traveled down the river. He said, The conduct of the elders became very displeasing. The specifics of their behaviors are unknown. For which Oliver Cowdery sternly rebuked them, saying, As the Lord God liveth, if you do not behave better, some accident will befall you. This rebuke, it turns out, only further irritated the elders, and the displeasing behavior continued. On the afternoon of the third day, when they would reach a hundred miles of downriver travel, Joseph joined the canoe of these elders, likely with the intent to help defuse the situation, but, according to Ezra, it only got worse. Then, in a moment of danger on the river, these elders apparently refused to exert their physical powers to help row and steer the canoe, in consequence of which they hit a submerged log, a common hazard on the Missouri River, and nearly capsized. This unnerved Joseph, and he urged everyone off the river before sunset at a riverbank they called McKilwain's Bend, near modern-day Miami, Missouri. And at some point after having set up camp here, Joseph's history says, Brother William W. Phelps, in an open vision by daylight, saw the destroyer, in his most horrible power, ride upon the face of the waters. Others heard the noise, but saw not the vision. Meanwhile, Ezra Booth's history states, Preparations were made to spend the night as comfortably as existing circumstances would admit, and then an attempt was made to effect a reconciliation betwixt the contending parties. This attempt excited considerable feeling on both sides, he said. Oliver's stern rebuke from earlier was brought up in this council, and he and Joseph were represented by the offended elders as being highly imperious and quite dictatorial. And Joseph and Sidney were called cowards, apparently because of their concern about the dangers of the Missouri River. This meeting went on for several hours into the night, until at some point early in the morning, everyone reconciled. Joseph's history says, The next morning, after prayer, I received the following. So that's the backstory of DNC 61. Now let's look at the details of the revelation he received that morning. Behold and hearken unto the voice of him who has all power, the Lord begins, who is from everlasting to everlasting, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He then declares to these elders of my church who are assembled upon this spot that their sins are now forgiven. For I, the Lord, forgive sins and am merciful unto those who confess their sins with humble hearts. This declaration came fresh on the hills of the elders confessing their sins and being reconciled to one another that very morning. In verses 3 to 6, the Lord begins addressing their travel by water. First, he says, It is not needful for this whole company of mine elders to be moving swiftly upon the waters, whilst the inhabitants on either side are perishing in unbelief. Some of them at least ought to be preaching to these people on the land as they travel home. Nevertheless, he says, He allowed them to travel by river thus far, that ye might bear record that there are many dangers upon the waters, and more especially hereafter. For I, the Lord, have decreed in mine anger many destructions upon the waters, yea, and especially upon these waters, meaning the Missouri River, which had a reputation at the time of being particularly dangerous to navigate. For one, it was considered navigable only about three months out of the year, and even then it was very difficult to navigate due to what an 1837 geographical dictionary described as the dangers of the ever-varying channel of the river. Other publications of the time noted that submerged logs, called sawyers, were the terror of the riverboat pilot and the most formidable dangers to navigation of the river, causing 70% of all steamboat wrecks. These wrecked and sunken boats then in turn became underwater hazards for future boats, and so on. Additionally, there was at the time a global cholera pandemic raging, whose spread was being hastened in the U.S. by way of the rivers connecting the cities, including the Missouri River. Add all of this together and we can perhaps understand why in John Whitmer's heading for section 61, he referred to the Missouri River as the river destruction. So the Lord's saying in verse 4 that he wanted them to experience a taste of the dangers on the Missouri River so that you may now bear record in warning others, a point he brings up again in verse 18. To this end, the following year, William W. Phelps wrote an editorial to the saints, giving them instruction upon the subject of journeying to the land of Zion wherein he explained that both this revelation, section 61, and experience have already shown that to come by land, especially from the state of Ohio, is the safest and generally the quickest and cheapest. Besides the saving of time and money, he wrote, you save risks and many dangers, firstly, of disasters upon the waters, and secondly, in some degree, the fear and trouble of the cholera. Now, all of this caution notwithstanding, the Lord gave this assurance in verse 6, Nevertheless, all flesh is in mine hand. And he that is faithful among you shall not perish by the waters. 
Wherefore, he says, it is expedient that my servant Sidney Gilbert and my servant William W. Phelps be in haste upon their errand and mission, which was to purchase a printing press for the church in Zion. The Lord is here saying that they could continue on down the river without fear. In his own history of this time, Phelps said that after this revelation was received, all the company, save myself and Brother Gilbert, left the river and proceeded by land. I was assured by revelation to be safe by land or water. The Lord told them he didn't want the group to split up and take separate routes until you were chastened for all your sins, that you might be one, that you might not perish in wickedness. But now, having been reconciled to one another, it behooveth me that ye should part. So Sidney Gilbert and William W. Phelps are to take their journey in haste, that they may fill their mission, with an added assurance that inasmuch as they are faithful, they shall be preserved, and I the Lord will be with them. Before giving instructions to the rest of the group, he returns in verses 13 through 19 to the topic of the dangerous river, about which he says, I will reason with you as with men in days of old. What he then explains is actually quite puzzling and arcane. He says that, In the beginning he blessed the waters, but in the last days by the mouth of my servant John, I cursed the waters. Who John is, when exactly in the last days John did this, or why the Lord would do so through John, or at all, he does not say. Wherefore the days will come that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters. Whether this means all waters everywhere, or just the Missouri River, he does not say. And for how long no flesh will be safe upon the waters, he does not specify. His exact meaning in verses 16 and 17 is likewise opaque. Yet this all seems to be building to his command in verse 18, that they should forewarn your brethren concerning these waters as they journey to Zion, that they come not in journeying upon them, lest their faith fail and they are caught in snares. He then summarizes rather cryptically in verse 19, saying, I the Lord have decreed, and the destroyer rideth upon the face thereof, and I revoke not the decree. Hmm. Does this mean that some divinely authorized destructive force has been let loose upon the Missouri River? And if the destroyer is in fact a divinely authorized destructive force, is it some type of sentient being, like a destroying angel, or even the devil of hell himself? Or is this just a poetic way of describing dangerous undercurrents, submerged logs, sunken ships, and cholera? Well, it's unclear. And since the Lord never explains his meaning here, we would do well to be cautious and tentative in our speculations about such things. In verse 20, he tells the group, I, the Lord, was angry with you yesterday due to their contention on the water, but today mine anger is turned away due to their recent repentance and reconciliation with one another. He then again briefly addresses William Phelps and Sidney Gilbert, telling them to take their journey in haste and explaining that it mattereth not unto me whether they go by water or by land. In verses 23 to 32, he addresses Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith, and Oliver Cowdery directly, instructing them to come not again upon the waters, save it be upon the Erie Canal, while journeying unto their homes. This is also his counsel for the journeying of my saints generally, who travel up unto the land of Zion. That is, they are not to travel by water other than the Erie Canal. Instead, they are to do like unto the children of Israel, pitching their tents by the way on land. This is the course for the saints, or the way for the saints of the camp of the Lord to journey, he says. He instructs Sidney, Joseph, and Oliver to not open their mouths in the congregations of the wicked until they arrive at Cincinnati, and there they shall lift up their voices unto God against that people, whose wickedness at the time, he said, made them well nigh ripened for destruction. From there, they are to head directly home to their brethren in Ohio, where they are needed more abundantly among them than among the congregations of the wicked. In verses 33 to 35, he addresses the residue of the elders there on that river bend telling them to journey and declare the word among the congregations of the wicked, two by two as seemeth them good, all the way home. He then concludes with encouraging counsel to be of good cheer, little children, for I am in your midst, and I have not forsaken you. And inasmuch as you have humbled yourselves before me, the blessings of the kingdom are yours. They are to gird up your loins and be watchful and be sober, looking forth for the coming of the Son of Man, for he cometh in an hour you think not. Pray always that you enter not into temptation, that you may abide the day of his coming, whether in life or in death. Even so, amen. The next day, on the 13th of August, Joseph and his companions crossed the Missouri River and traveled by land to nearby Sheraton, and there serendipitously ran into Joseph's brother Hiram and elders David Whitmer, John Murdoch, and Harvey Whitlock. These brethren were still en route to Zion, having been preaching the gospel all along their way from Ohio. John Murdoch had become ill a week or so earlier, and so he and Hiram, his mission companion, 
had been waiting in the small settlement of Sheraton while John recovered. They had been there a short time when they were joined by David and Harvey. Then, almost miraculously, Joseph and his party had suddenly arrived as well. Joseph's history records, I met several of the elders on their way to the land of Zion, and after the joyful salutations with which brethren meet each other who are actually contending for the faith, I received the following revelation on their behalf. So that's the backstory of DNC 62. Now let's look at the Lord's brief message to these elders at this time. To this faithful group of elders, he introduces himself compassionately as the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ your advocate, who knoweth the weakness of man and how to succor them who are tempted. He says that as they have not as yet gone up unto the land of Zion, their mission is not yet full. Nevertheless, ye are blessed, he praises, for the testimony which ye have borne to all those along their way to Zion is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon, and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. They are to continue your journey and then assemble yourselves upon the land of Zion and hold a meeting there and rejoice together and offer a sacrament unto the Most High. After this, you may return home to bear record, yea, even all together as a group, or two by two as seemeth you good. It mattereth not unto me. All that matters is that they be faithful and declare glad tidings unto the inhabitants of the earth or among the congregations of the wicked. Intriguingly, in verse 6, he says, I the Lord have brought you together, that the promise might be fulfilled, that the faithful among you should be preserved and rejoice together in the land of Missouri. I the Lord promise the faithful and cannot lie. This is a reference to a passing promise he made to them back in Ohio two months earlier, recorded in DNC 5242, where he said, If ye are faithful, ye shall assemble yourselves together to rejoice upon the land of Missouri. So the Lord is telling them here that it was neither chance nor happenstance that these two groups bumped into each other on their separate journeys to and from Zion, but rather that the Lord deliberately brought you together in order to fulfill His seemingly small promise that the faithful would rejoice together in the land of Missouri. As for these elders' journey the rest of the way to Zion and back home, the Lord says that whether they desire to ride upon horses or upon mules or in chariots, they'll be granted that desire as long as they receive it from the hand of the Lord with a thankful heart in all things. Such particulars remain with you to do according to judgment and the directions of the Spirit, he says. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and behold and lo, I am with the faithful always. Even so, amen. So by way of summary of DNC 60, 61, and 62, we might say this. Although these sections contain much that is specific to the mundane particulars of an over 800-mile journey between Missouri and Ohio, and several descriptions of timely duties of elders limited to that 1831 context, as well as a quizzical description of cursed waters therein, it is also true that the character of Christ is on full display throughout these revelations. For instance, throughout these sections we learn that He is pleased by obedience and best efforts, and is displeased and even angered by lazy disobedience and negligence, by those who hide the gospel gift He has entrusted them with, and by contention among His servants. Yet, he is also very quick to forgive those who humbly confess their sins. He wants us to learn from our errors and mistakes and warn others of the same. We learn that the reason he wants the gospel preached to the wicked is because he is concerned for them and does not want them to perish. We also learn that sometimes the details of how we achieve the objectives he has given us don't really matter to him. For instance, three times in these sections he says regarding their mode of travel, it mattereth not unto me. Furthermore, we learn that he has all power. He is our advocate. He knows both the weakness of man and how to succor them who are tempted. We learn that he sometimes brings people together to fulfill promises he has made to the faithful and that he cannot lie. And to the faithful he says, I am in your midst and have not forsaken you. And behold and lo, I am with the faithful always. So in addition to their historical significance, perhaps the most lasting value of these sections to the modern reader are these glistening autobiographical gems that Jesus Christ is displaying and describing about his own character. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenants 60 through 62. 